Hello everyone. I hope everybody can hear me loud and clear. Um, so you all know the drill by now, uh, so I'm not going to spend any more time than is needed on this. Today we have John. He's going to have a very interesting lecture, but I'm going to leave the introduction over to him. And so, yeah, you know what I'm here for? I'm here to thank, of course, the people that made this happen. Thank you to all the participants of the Summer of Nix this year. This is very special thanks to the Annalen Foundation, the European Commission, the Nix Rise Foundation, and Tweak for supporting these lecture series and setting them up. Without much further ado, I am going to pull John in here. Uh, hello, John. Hey. Hi, Brian. And I will put your slides in here as well. There you go. Good luck, John. Great. Well, hi, everyone else, too. Um, thanks so much, Brian, for uh, walking me through the always exciting steps getting ready. And uh, thanks to all those organizations, too, for making this lecture series happen. Um, I'm really happy to be here and talk to you all about what we've done on this sort of line of work since um, Nix IPFS two years ago, discussed at NixCon. Um, so first, just a little about me. Um, I'm John Erickson. I've been using NixOS since 2014, um, and shortly after, I've been trying to contribute back in various ways. Um, I've been an uh, engineer, software engineer at Obsidian Systems since 2017. Um, and through my work at Obsidian, I've been able to hit a number of uh, old goals of mine, such as first cross compilation, um, then the IPFS um, work, and now this. So definitely very happy um, that I've had a chance to uh, tick off, check off these boxes that have been uh, sitting with me for quite a while and try to move Nix from the thing we have today to the thing we all want to have in the future. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, I'll get into the talk proper. Oh, anyway, um, first of all, I have, have all the acronyms in the titles, but SWH is software heritage. Um, and this is, uh, the new part of this ecosystem of integrations I'm talking about today. Um, make that a little bit bigger. So I can see my own slides. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Chromium is doing a very odd thing when I resize the window. Well, I'll just scoot in. I tried to make the slides a little bit bigger, but the StreamYard Slayer system is a bit weird. <laughs> I think, sorry, Chromium just froze. Oh. Um, I can hear you all, and I guess you all can hear me, but yeah. I'm not getting any visuals, so I think I need to rejoin. No, that's that's fine. I will wait here and, until you arrive again. Okay, sorry about that. No, it's no problem. We're doing these things live, so technical difficulties can happen, of course. <laughs> so yeah, whilst we wait for John to come back uh, until he reboots, um, what are you guys working on? What are you doing with Nix? I'm curious. Is there anything exciting you want to tell me about? I myself, I'm trying to use Nix for embedded purposes, as that is what my background is in a little bit. And it's, it's been quite the adventure to say the least. Let me see if on casts. And by the way, don't be shy. Okay, so David is a, is a beginner, still learning. I mean, we all have to start it somewhere. I remember my first days. Uh, on Nix, they were quite interesting. And Paul provides home manager profile for developers at work. Cool. I see that John has come back. So hey, uh, hello, John. So you have to re-add the slides. Yes. So that, ah, I remembers them. There we go. Okay, wonderful. Well, good to be back, you all. <laughs> yes, I will drop out again. I'll. Wait. I think uh, this is the slide you were on, right? Um, 
I I I was pressing buttons. Not sure. I'll just. <laughs> I remember that this is the last slide that we were on. Okay. I will draw. Yeah. Yeah. Again. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, first thing to do, since it has been two years since I last talked about this, is briefly recap our Nix and IPFS work. Um, goal is to integrate Nix with IPFS, um, and. The way we did this was, in many cases, not even that IPFS specific. Um, we added a number of sort of what I think of as general improvements to Nix, such as Git hashing, um, such as Nix stores that aren't directly Nix specific and sort of work in this more abstract constant addressing manner where, for example, you don't use store path as keys. Um, and if you have a constant address, which we always do in this case, you don't need extra metadata that like the NAR hash is totally specific to Nix. Um, and we also got the ball rolling on CA derivations, um, following up from Theophon's initial RFCs and plans, of course. Um, and then from these steps, none of which mentions IPFS by names, um, the IPFS store implementation was actually very easy and um, natural to write. Um, and so that is, um, for me, that was sort of a hallmark of hoping we had a good design where we weren't just pulling Nix in random directions to work with IPFS, but we did a few sort of natural want them anyways improvements. And then IPFS just slides right in round peg and round hole. Um, and um, also we added some outside the store layer and the fetchers layer support for Git hashing um, and fetch tree and fetch Git. Um, and finally, I have some links at the bottom. Um, I'll see if I can get these slides shared so you can click on those links and read about more information if you um, want a refresher or miss the talk two years ago or whatever else. Um, where's the, the next slide button? Um, we have just a few things merged so far. Uh, really, the CA derivations work and a few NISC behind the scenes cleanup PRs. And so um, just in the weeks leading up to this talk and um, getting a first version of the Software Heritage IPFS bridge out the door, we finally written an RFC to hopefully kick off a formal conversation with the Nix community and see what we can do um, with the rest of these parts. Um, and so in the meantime, um, I, you know, I hope that conversation would go well either way, but I wanted to um, sort of add more pieces to the puzzle to broaden the story of why we want IPFS with Nix. Um, so as the RFC makes clear, there's sort of a bifurcated motivation for why we're doing, we previously did this IPFS and Nix integration. Um, on one hand, there is binary distribution. So distributing build artifacts um, this is sort of the, the first motivation that everyone thinks of um, because we have a very large cache.nixos today. Um, and everyone's always wondering about new ways we can move those artifacts around. Um, but there's a second motivation that I've increasingly become fond of, which is the source distribution and archival motivation. Um, with this one, we're not dealing with anything Nix made. We're just dealing with the ultimate inputs to Nix. Um, if any of you all have tried to build old versions of Nix packages for various reasons, you'll see there's often a case where old um, sources or source code that we download go stale, links rot. Um, and for both individuals and institutions looking to make sure that not only could we continue to build our old software in principle, but it actually works in practice because we didn't lose the data, this is very important. Um, and then there's also this indirect motivation, which I'll um, come back to, of trying to find other projects that just think in Nick's ways, um, work in Nick's ways, and are sort of our natural allies. Um, so the Nix is, of course, a very uh, different way of approaching software and DevOps and all that than many things out there. Um, and so that because we're so different, that makes for a harder learning curve, whether or not we're, you know, we think to ourselves we're easy or hard. 
because learning curves are always relative of what people's baseline knowledge is. Um, so I think in addition to having good allies, it's good to try to rather than make us like the rest of the world, which is great, but can sometimes dilute the value proposition, try to make the rest of the world by us, um, like us. And this is sort of an underrated way to, instead of uh, hitting down the top of the learning curve ramp, lift up the bottom. Um, so software heritage um, fits in in the second of the direct motivations and the indirect motivation. Um, software heritage, as I'll soon explain, is um, has a huge archive of as much open source software as they get their hands on. So they are the source code archive. Um, and um, with IPVest involved, as opposed to directly querying the software heritage archive, there's a chance to sort of make your own CDN mix together an archive of, let's say, your own private software and the public common software. Um, so there's a sort of, we were both giving people access to the archive, the central one, and allowing them to sort of roll their own with whatever extra stuff they may to add. And then finally, we're sort of continuing the coalition building and ally finding, or at least I hope so, um, with uh, software heritage, again, being a very natural um, sort of in their, in their goals and their approaches and methodology, a very natural partner for us. And indeed, um, unlike protocol uh, software heritage, uh, excuse me, unlike IPFS and um, protocol labs, the company behind IPFS, we've actually been dealing with uh, software heritage and these folks at um, Aria and stuff for years. So <laughs> I can't give myself credit in making a new bridge from the Nix ecosystem to them when we already have one, but I can at least lay down a few more lanes on that existing structure. Um, so um, yeah, more about software heritage. Um, as I said, they are trying to collect as much software as they can, um, license for minions, and they're doing a spectacular job with one petabyte so far, which may not sound large from a video or audio perspective, but um, it's uh, quite impressive for text files and source code where the, the goal is always to be terse. Um, also, they are already constant addressing all their stuff for deduplication purposes. And the software heritage IDs they use are essentially um, Get, I, uh, get hashes with a little extra metadata in the identifier and also an additional object format to represent whole repos, which are not constant addressed in Git. So they're a very, um, they're a very nice, small incremental step over vanilla Git hashing. And the files and directories we care about are um, work ident identically in both systems. Um, and again, I have some more info links um, to anyone that wants to uh, see the slides after and learn more than I have time to talk about. Yeah, so um, <laughs> again, as I said, um, software heritage is not a new friend of the ecos Nix ecosystem at all. Um, I am definitely building on the um, re outreach that others have done already. Um, there's Tweak did some very nice work with them also two years ago, trying to, as I understand it, um, make sure that anything that Nix packages was referencing was at least trying to be ingested um, in the archive. So essentially using Nix packages as a um, new source of things to go fetch, um, not unlike how a car a crates.io might be used that way. Um, but there are some difficulties in that sometimes we hash the underlying thing and sometimes we just hash a tarball um, and even when we do hash the underlying thing, we use our bespoke NAR hashes, which no one else does. So um, there actually is a whole section in that great blog post, content hash versus terrible hash. I just pulled out the uh, final paragraph here, which um, rather than describing the problem, sort of emphasizes what would be nice to have instead. Um, and I won't do the awkward thing of reading a long quote on my slides, but just to paraphrase it, um, it's very good when we don't um, mix in sort of incidental notions like how to compress into our hashes 
to keep the more pure content addresses, not these tarballs. Um, and it's also good um, if we do that content addressing in a way that is um, not like a bespoke format that just one piece of technology, be it Nix software heritage or anything else uses, but a sort of emerging common standard. Um, so that was the, the on the Nix side, the um, all the work for that was done two years ago with the IPFS work, but we uh, continue to leverage it with this leg of the project as um, we already had IPFS and Nix now using Git hashing and software heritage using gashing. So we are building out the um, amount of compatible things that can all talk to each other and all constant address in the same way um, in a sort of real constant address without any other metadata that we don't want mixed in polluting it. Um, so um, with that sort of underlying story of interop there, um, we can get into exactly how everything works. Um, so the first step is already done, the Nix and IPFS. Um, the new part today is a software and IPF software heritage and IPFS bridge. Um, and again, we see sort of a parallel um, parallel method in both cases where Nix is using IPFS as a Nix store. And now IPFS is using software heritage as a block store. So we're all in both cases, we're sort of sliding, um, sliding under um, the the sort of originator of request technology with a new backend. Um, also, I have to thank Anelna again, um, in addition to uh, putting, helping sponsor the Summer of Nix and this talk today, they also uh, sponsored this project and that's the link to the project page on their website. So as always, thanks so much Anelnet for doing so much to keep the Nix ecosystem and broader ecosystem of open source stuff um, well running. Um, yes, yeah, so back to the technical details with this two layers of sliding things other, we have a very colonial clear source of requests. Things can come from Nix, they can go from IPFS and from there they can be relayed to software heritage. And then the responses likewise will um, fall back in the other direction, software heritage to IPFS back to Nix. Um, and the nice thing about this is Nix doesn't need to know about software heritage at all. Um, in fact, I did not even test the Nix IPFS integration and software heritage and IPFS bridge until I was preparing this talk. Um, I just got very lucky there that the um, design that says things were orthogonal um, agreed with reality, which also said things were orthogonal and the puzzle pieces just snapped right together. So our actual software heritage IPFS bridge itself um, has three parts. And this, since this is a Nix talk and not an IPFS talk, I'm not going to go into too many details on this. But um, just as a small summary, um, first of all, there is making sure that IPFS can parse all the objects, which it needs to know what references they themselves have. Um, so the, or sorry, the very first part before that is augmenting the software heritage API, their own HTTP API, which had a number of um, endpoints already to get data from the archive, but did not have one that just gave you the raw objects as they are hashed. Um, so we first did that. Um, it's a currently unstable API, so you um, need a, need an access token to try it out today that has some extra perms, but it's there. And if you click that URL, you can get the docs. It's a very straightforward. You give it a software heritage ID. It gives you a bunch of bytes. If you hash those bytes, you get the same hash as this, um, the hash part of the software heritage ID you query with. Um, the second part is the codec. Um, so as I said, um, get software heritage's hashing and git hashing is very compatible um but there's a few cases where software heritage extends it um on the object side that is the snapshot objects which represent whole repos so these um 
Git itself does not constant address whole repos. It just constant address commits um, tags if they're signed, directories, and files. And so the, the repo is just a collection of stuff that has its known hash. So they wanted to um, also be able to say, well, if we're going to archive an entire repo, we want a hash for that entire repo at the point of archival. And so they made this snapshots format. Uh, this is actually not at all necessary for Nix, which doesn't care anything about repos or history. It just wants the directories and, uh, and uh, files, but um, just uh, you know, not a lot of points of the architecture. Um, there's we I didn't want to skip talking about that. And then finally, the important part, which is the data store plugin for IPFS. Um, so this uses will will um, intercept a request um, that thinks it's going to storage that could originate with a CLI on, on the local node or over the network. And instead of doing a regular look it up in the local database, we'll instead translate it to the Software Heritage Web API. And likewise, if it gets a response, uh, relay that. So of um, all, all these things, um, the, the first and the third are the essential ones for what I'm about to demo. And the second is there for completeness so you can get all the software heritage data, but isn't very relevant to Nix. And yes, uh, with that, it is now time for the demo, uh, which will hopefully make this all much more clear. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, so the first thing we need to do is think of a project that um, is on GitHub or otherwise well known that um, Software Heritage probably has archived. So I will just think of something on GitHub. Um, but if anyone else has any ideas, do drop them in the chat. I'm uh, happy to live dangerously and um, use a crowd submitted repo to fetch from instead. Um, So what I'm doing now is just picking a decently well-known repo, um, finding an older tag. So we're pretty confident the archive is caught up. And then I will get the commit hash for this. My uh, monitor is quite big, but I'll at least try to make the terminals bigger. Okay, up oh, there. So this right here is great. Okay, so to recap a bit, um, and Actually, you know, before I get, oh, is it possible for me to paste a thing in the comments or only audience members, Brian? Um, I believe only audience members, but if you can send it to me somewhere, and maybe you could perhaps post it in Matrix. Um, most people can read it over there. There should be a channel, Summer of Nick's Azuan dash lecture series. Mm -hmm. Or if you send it to me in a oh. DM, I'll I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll um, yeah. it's it is it's you know, I I won't bother then. It's um uh, okay. I close matrix on the um computer. Um, or there John, is even uh, on Streamyard. You see, I don't see it on your screen, but there should be a private chat somewhere where we can exchange that, and I can relay it. On oh oh okay. Yeah, if you post it there, then I can. Oh, perfect. Great. Yeah, I'll post Bye. it on the on the channels. You guys should be seeing it in a minute. In a few seconds, a minute is a bit yeah. long. <laughs> <laughs> Let me um I I don't think unfortunately on Wayland I can do individual um screen share. Or individual I, windows shares. Do not know. Um some people were asking about that. But maybe if um hmm. 
I can I can try to just resize things and hope that um and then I can zoom in enough. Yes. I will full screen your screen then if that's okay again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so this is the um, readme for the plugin. And I think it's actually good to go over that instead before I start cutting and pasting things in the terminal. Um, so the first thing to note is that a software heritage identifier looks something like this, where it has software heritage version one says what sort of object is where cnt is for content which means file and then this is a base 16 sha um one get hash and on the nix side or sorry on the ipfs side uh, references are always self-describing and so we have these bits that say roughly that same metadata in front and so as I'm diving around the terminal, I will be quite often peeling or pasting this string right here at the beginning of the git hash. Um, then in the um, config of this thing, which I won't show you, um, you can, to use this, besides getting the sort of custom build of IPFS from this repo with the plugin, you want to edit your config and so um, you will get a software heritage authentication token and can put that stuff in here, which is the um, configuration for the storage layer. Since we are um, faking software heritage as an alternate storage backend. And then finally, you can use these DAG get commands to create an IPFS fetch request and um, using one of these hashes. So these will actually go all over to the network. Um, it can check the, it'll check the DHT to see if anyone has this, this hash. The answer is probably no, but it will also talk to existing, um, existing peers you are bridged with. And so going back over here to my now very zoomed in. Okay. I'm just gonna um, rearrange these windows and hope chroming doesn't crash again. Okay, hopefully this is still big enough to read. So what I've got over here on this side is a separate IPFS node, which is the version with the plugin with some extra logging on. And then I also have my main system-wide NixOS managed IPFS node that is um, being used in this terminal and you see I'm in this temp directory. This is from following the instructions for the, um, the Nix IPFS integration. So essentially in the terminal on the left, I've done everything described in the new software heritage IPFS bridge readme. And in the terminal on the right, I've done everything described setting up in the IPFS Nix guide. So um, using that, OCaml, that uh, OCaml um, commit hash I had gotten, I then prepended the magic bytes I previously discussed right there and did a dag get. And the first time I did this, my regular IPFS node then talked to the bridge node, which I had previously made sure they were connected. And it started doing all these software heritage requests to get the data. And then it returns it to me um, over the IPFS protocol from the one node to the other node. And then finally, I um, it, it displays that in a JSON format, and then I pretty it up with JQ. Uh, so we hear this is the basic 
commit metadata here. Um, it says Aria, uh, which is good sign because they do OCaml things. So it looks like we have the right repo. Um, and we also have a tree hash, which I'll look at the moment, which would be the actual files we care about and not the history stuff, which Nix doesn't. So again, nothing here says GitHub, nothing here actually says software heritage. This is just um, a self-describing uh, content address known in IPFS land as a CID content identifier. And just because of the way I happen to have things set up, it can figure out, ask a bunch of things, find one that claims it can respond, see how it responds, verify the data, display the data. All that is not um, unlike imp unlike um, with uh, location-based addressing, not part of my request, but just incidental in the way the network is set up. So the next thing we want to do is see some files. Um, so it does more requests. Again, we saw actions over here because it had to, um, well, this node talked to this node, which talked to Software Heritage, which um, had the request lock. But if I do the same thing again, now it's cached on my main node and it doesn't need to talk to the bridge node and it's a little faster. Um, so you see here a bunch of stuff. Um, don't need to look at all those, but what we can, um, this, this would be, in fact, I can do it like this. So that's the same thing, but as opposed to cutting and pasting the hashes, I can just do a sort of relative uh, path thing where I just say slash tree. And then maybe we can look in the yak directory of this repo. And it'll do a few more fetching. And OK, we have a few things there. Um, so this, in a sense, becomes a hash that we maybe can download, not too big for purposes of the demo. So right here, this is base64 encoded or something that um, it is not the normal Git way of doing it, but I can convert it to base 16. And then this right here, um, this is again, the magic few bytes and then a regular base 16 Git hash. Um, so I can just uh, show it's the same stuff. I can put in that thing with the magic bytes, get the same thing I queried before cache so it doesn't need to talk to the bridge node again um but what i can also do is have nix download this um, so um let me explain what's going on here um so this nix that i'm running is the um uh is our is our modified version of Nix from two years ago? Um, that is um, the a statically linked one that you can download in the Nix guide. And indeed, I, I didn't rebuild it or anything. I just download that old binary. And thanks to Linux for not changing the Cisco interface, it still works. Um, I could have used a fixed output derivation, but instead, I'm using the libfetchers fetch tree for to demonstrate this. Um, so it's a fetch tree that's type git. The URL, however, is totally bogus. It's HTTPS colon slash slash nope, which clearly we're not going to be able to get any data from. And then there's this new triage field unique to the fork that um, has the now the magic byte stripped hash that I just pasted in. And then the substitutors is a trustless IPFS store. Um, so the details of this command are all things that I talked about um, two years ago. There are no, no new work here, um, just using it. Um, so I, will not, I won't go into too many details about how all this stuff works, but just say if you want to know more, um, you can read the guide or find my talk from NixCon uh, 2019. Or excuse me, excuse me NixCon 2020. Um, 
Now, if I download this, as opposed to looking at a single object, it's going to recursively get a bunch of objects. It has to get both the directory object and all the file objects. Um, as you can also see, this is quite slow. Um, so I see John Ringer is asking what have been the stumbling points been, and um, certainly this this uh, this um, this slowness is something that ought to be fixed. And I will uh, after the demo go into more details of why it is slow and what we can do about it. Perhaps while we are waiting, we have one more question actually from yeah. Mick92 uh, on the OnCas instance. And they ask uh, that they're very interesting in knowing if the performance of IPFS has improved since the last time they tried using it for their next binary caching. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm using IPFS in this very low level way where I'm not using the DHT, I'm not using IPNS. Um, I'm just using it as like a sort of point to point relay thing um, so that you don't have to, um, yeah, so you, you can sort of unhard code these, where am I getting the data just right down the constant address um, and have that method. And for that, I think it works great. Um, again, I'm, I'm not really stress testing it, but it's, um, like the underlying, how can we exchange data back and forth? Um, ask all my peers if they have the data when the DHT doesn't have an answer. That all seems to work really rock solid. Um, and indeed is sort of algorithmically nice. So I'd sort of expect it to work well versus um, making the DHT scale. They've, they've done a great job, but it's a much harder problem. So I'm sort of of the opinion, it's sort of a walk before you run thing. Um, Example, I an anticipate that rather than people setting up their own bridges and getting their own auth tokens, um, so there could be a sort of single central bridge administered by software of heritage that they can control sort of rate limiting and other things with. And if you want to fall back on the network, you can just connect to that node. Um, and instead, IPFS would be acting as a CDN because as you can see, pulling data from software heritage this way is extremely slow. Um, I also have a feeling I fetched the wrong thing that I didn't mean to fetch. Because um, <laughs> I uh, purposely, yes, yes, okay. I, that would explain it. Um, I had meant to just do this yak subdirectory. Um, should, uh, should be much smaller. Right, okay, yeah, this is no big nested stuff, it's just a few things. Um, Clipper is all messed up since going to Wayland, which is somewhat embarrassing. And now you all get to see it. <laughs> Again, we do these things live, so it's, it's, it's authentic <laughs> at least. Well, the em embarrassing part is I've been on Wayland a few months and I haven't bothered to actually get this fixed. Hmm. Um, it's just been... Well, my case is even... Things. My case is even worse because I just assume that GNOME does everything for me. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the terminal works, then GNOME's doing its job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, this, yeah, this here. They both start with C, but this one is C, F, it looks like. Yeah, after the, oh, it's 28 CF. I cut and paste it wrong.
Yay. Okay. Um, so now the nice moment of truth. Um, this is a tree actually fetched. If I were to scroll up properly in this, which I doubt I can do live, somewhere in there it will say that exact 28 CFC with um, uh, uh, SH, the SWH1 CN, uh, excuse me, SWH1 DIR appended in front because um, we're trying to fetch that directory. And then on the next side, I can do next path info, paste that in, JSON. And here, fix git SHA1, this thing, up oh, base64, but there, the same hash, 28CF, and um, when we did the fetch, 28CF. So um, this this is a single hatch fetch, but this is not an impure fetch since this version of Nix knows about the Git hashing. Um, again, old stuff we previously did. It um, this this we only need one hash. We don't need two hashes like today, where you need a NAR hash in addition to some sort of how to fetch a hash. This is all um, pure eval compatible. Uh, it just uses a single hash. And even and because the URL is busted, it falls back as a substituter, which knows how to get it. Um, so it's all, I think, I would like to think a very simple, um, uh, a very, a very simple um, user experience where we can, just like today with a fetch tree or a um, fixed output derivation fetching, just write down one hash, not two. The hash is actually meaningful to the technology we're trying to fetch from. Um, and we would probably put in a real URL, but if that URL bit rots and Software Heritage has a copy, we can fall back on that. And um, it may be slow, but it will work. Um, also, the second time you do this, it's obviously really quick because it already has a copy. Oh, I should I should show the files actually do exist. Um, oh, there they are. That's kind of unreadable. I'll do what Ellis said. So there's a this was the yak subdirectory, and there is some C things that seem parsing related, and indeed. Here we see those same files um, in just the IPFS view of that data. So we, you know, we we have the same stuff. All all three parties, Software Heritage, Nix, and IPFS agree on their hash, um, and um, if I. If I delete this thing, it's gone. And I can do that. Oh. Wait a minute. Yeah, so it really is gone. And then if I try to download it again, now it's much faster. So I, I, it wasn't a trick. I really did delete it, but instead of having to go back to the bridge node, which is so slow, it can. There's a cache copy, um, just until the next garbage collection with my name, main IPFS node. Um, so just as this thing also didn't have to do any bridge communication, um, getting all the data, likewise just worked, and it's basically at least to me as instantaneous as if the files were already in the next store. Um, so this is just a very simple um, local node caching example, but through the same principle, um, I think even if the bridge is slow and we do want to make it faster, um, 
IPFS should still be able to work as a CDN whenever people are requesting the same data. And that in turn um, takes um, bandwidth pressure off software heritage. So they can be the archive of last resort and not just a go-to thing where people get their stuff because they're too lazy to find it anywhere else. And since they are a nonprofit focusing on archiving, not dissemination, that's a big benefit to them. Um, just as you know, you shouldn't go to your uh, national like archival library, like in the US Library of Congress to just pick up a bestseller that's gonna be anywhere. Um, you also shouldn't try to hit the software heritage cache for something that's well known and gonna have a bunch of other copies out in the ether. Um, and just as libraries have this sort of interlibrary loan, um, human level protocol, that's, that's basically what IPFS is um, doing that on the internet. Um, and that is uh, the end of the demo portion. Do you want to put my slides back, Brian? Um, okay. So yeah, just to recap there, um, things I was saying during the demo, all layers are using the same hashes. Um, and on the next side, that is only the one hash, the git hash. Um, Nix doesn't know about software heritage at all. This is unmodified from two years ago, fork of Nix didn't do anything to uh, bring it up to the future work, it just did the substitutors IPFS and um, let my regular node talk to the bridge node. Um, and finally, then the caching works on multiple levels. So I showed both the delete it in the Nix side, refetch it and the um, and of course, the, it's still in the next door. You don't have to refetch anything at all, even in the shallowest sense. Um, and that is the, the backbone of the CDN strategy. Um, so then finally, um, future work. Um, we want to deploy a public bridge so that you don't have to get a super special auth token. Um, and Software Heritage doesn't have a gazillion people spamming them with requests, but just sort of one central choke point they can uh, monitor the research usage of. Um, and we want to make it faster. Um, this is obviously extremely slow 90s era speeds right now. Um, the reason for that is with this sort of Merkle tree fetching scheme, you have to fetch an object before you know what you want to fetch next uh, naively because you don't a priori know the child references and your children's grandchildren's references and so on, you just know the root reference. Um, and that creates what in networking is known as a pipelining issue, where you can't even begin to request the next thing until you've completed the first thing. Um, and that is also much worse um, because not only are we doing the bad in principle pipelining, um, we also are like doing the from scratch HTTP, TCP, TLS, renegotiation every time. And so I'd imagine probably most of the time there is spent not even transferring bytes, which would go much quicker, but just endlessly deciding what to fetch, renegotiating connections and whatnot. Um, so it's it's sort of like a, the, um, the old, old um, Nix fetching of many years ago has some similar issues where it would... Uh, do that same spin up, tear down every time you want to fetch an individual store path. Um, the good news is that both on IPFS and software heritage, this problem is well known. Um, IPFS thing has a graph sync protocol where instead of saying, give me this one object um, by this hash, you just say, give me the closure and it will sort of do a quick traverse on the remote side, get you as many different hashes as possible of that closure. And then you can start broadcasting all those hashes concurrently to um, fetch as many things in parallel as possible. And on the software heritage side, um, they have this vault API, which I may have these details wrong, but it seems to be, again, you sort of say, hey, I wanna have some sort of tarball or other archive of the closure of an object it will go assemble of that for you async, let you know when it's done, and then you can download that um, big tarball or whatever in one fell swoop. 
So two different approaches, but in both cases, the concept is the same. Um, let's not have a bunch of round trip communication as we discover children, grandchildren, great grandchildren objects, but just communicate at a higher level to both ends that we want all the stuff. Um, how can we best transfer back and forth without constantly renegotiating what exactly is wanted? Um, so I think, um, I, I think, you know, as we, uh, figure out future plans, hopefully there'll be, um, a fairly straightforward way to find, uh, find a way for both sides to speak one of these sort of recursive fetching, closure fetching protocols and make things a lot more efficient. Um, and then finally, large object support. Um, IPFS has a very sort of elegant, chunky model today where objects are never more than a certain maximum transmission unit long. And if you have bigger data than that, you're supposed to split it up into more objects. Um, that's a, a very good design. I think the right design, the problem is Git objects, our current lingua franca that I'm using to get everyone to communicate with each other, um, don't have this sort of chunky built in and objects are arbitrary large. So we'll have to be a little clever trying to retrofit um, large, arbitrary large object support onto IPFS if we um, want to um, fetch those occasional very large uh, source files. Um, the, the so I'll just go for this talk, but the um, on the bi on the binary um, the 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 builds distribution, the binary distribution, so those the source distribution um, that is the other use case for IPFS and Nix. We we are not as wedded to the Git um, way of constant addressing things, and then we can um, avoid that problem in other ways. But for um, source code that is already Git hashed everywhere. We really are kind of stuck with those Git hashes and therefore want to make it work. Um, on the next side, um, there is upstreaming the next IPFS per the RFC I mentioned earlier. Um, there is also another thing I want to do, which is try to make the, in the, the store layer more independent and more standing alone. Um, if we are to like upstream this functionality in Nix and start thinking more broadly about different ways of scheduling builds, fetching data, constant addressing data, whatnot, the store layer is going to get a lot more complex. So I think giving it a bit of its own identity will help manage that um, complexity by enforcing the separation of concerns and, um, and therefore sort of allow us to keep a grapple on things. So I hope to write an RFC about this soon. Um, but basically, yeah, like, I'm fully aware of the things I want to do, um, add complexity, and therefore we need to have some sort of mitigations. And the second bullet point is basically my hopeful strategy of dealing with that. And then finally, broader ecosystem, because again, the indirect motivation with all the stuff is to try to find new like-minded partners for Nix, so we're not trying to revolutionize software by ourselves. Um, First thing here would be to continue trying to get people to constantly address um, software in a uniform way. So there's this sort of Git hashing thing we've done with IPFS and software heritage so far, but many language specific package managers might still be hashing tarballs and other things that um, Nix can kind of support, but it isn't really, it, it's not good for software heritage. It's not great for us because it, closes off some easy dedupe strategies um, and, and, and generally make, makes things less um, efficient as they could be in theory. So I, I hope to try to find um, one of those language specific package managers and sort of pitch them on um, constant address, um, constant address your source files in a way that's compatible with next compatible with software heritage and sort of here's a new way to be kind of a team player which historically these language specific pack managers have not been very good at, but maybe also not knowing how to do. Um, as part of, once you do those data model changes, um, IPF supports very easy. So if anyone wants like a cargo or hackage, crates.io hackage um, and PM mirror, it's a uh, very easy once everything's constant addressing the same way. Um, yeah, and overall just for the indirect motivation, uh, rather than 
contort ourselves to work with the outside world, try to entice the outside world in doing things which are good for them on their own, but also make it really easy to integrate with us. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much. That's my last slide. Um, I see we have a bunch of questions now. I'm happy to answer some yes. of those. There is a few questions that came in on Uncas as well, but we'll start with the question from uh, Confus on YouTube. Uh, Great. Who's asking, so when can we expect Next to ship with automatic default IPFS support? Um, that is not something I fully control. Um, go chime in in the RFC if that's something you care about. Um, I mean, the PRs are opened. I have to fix the conflicts and stuff, but I'm I'm ready to start merging things um, whenever people approve and you know do the code review. But um, you know, I I I can't just like unilaterally you know, like merge a bunch of stuff. Of course, that um, <laughs> that wouldn't be right. <laughs> If I recall correctly, it's Armin that said, um, if you bother Ilko enough, you'll eventually do it. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> there is that. But I mean, this, it, there is like, I, I've tried to keep the architectural changes minimal and surgical, um, such that, you know, IPFS could even be a Nix plugin. But the, the generalizations you need prior to IPFS, especially on the source side those are still a serious amount of stuff um i mean it's only in recent years that people have sort of started contributing to nix beyond elko in a broader capacity at all so i mean you know i i'm not gonna just pester him in random meetings and try to random down his throat um didn't want to do that in 2020 didn't want to do that today but I, I think the rfc process is the right way to sort of build community consensus yes, exactly. and then and then we'll see what he says, what other people say. Yes, that makes perfect sense. Then over on Owncast, Nuno is asking, do identifier hashes follow Git current practice, namely a hardened SH1 SH1 algorithm? Related question, could hash collisions become a concern? Um, those are good questions. So I... I haven't checked who has upgraded to the sort of band-aided hardened SHA-1, but I think everyone can and should do that. Uh, I know I know Git has itself. I would sort of assume Software Heritage is definitely aware of the issue and probably doing something about it. Um, IPFS also, um, I would think they would have that upgrade too. Nix, we... We currently don't really use SHA-1 that much in Nix, so we might have the bad old vanilla version, but we can do that upgrade also. Um, I'm obviously not wild about SHA-1, um, which is definitely end of life, but um, I also don't want to do the classic XKCD mistake of trying to push my own standard. I'm very much of the opinion, meet people where they're at, which today is Git hash and SHA-1, um, and then try to push things forward. So there is, um, for a few years now, SHA-256 support in Git, but uh, GitHub doesn't support it and nothing uses it. Um, but we could still, um, or, or both both us, um, this bridge, IPFS, should all be able to support that ahead of anyone actually using it because it's a very um, sort of parametric thing that all those things already don't assume uh, specific hashing strategy, unlike um, old Git. And so it, sh it should be easy to swap it out. And then from there, we just need an actual um, sort of user story or whatever on how to migrate existing repos. And I think we could help with that, but that's also like not our problem, I would say. Uh, by the time you're fetching something in Nix, if there is a SHA-256 copy, you don't care about the SHA-11, uh, you can just fix the um, the sort of new school view of the repo. It's only when you're pushing data to repos that you have to update both versions if you're trying to do some sort of migration scheme. And that's the thing that hasn't yet been implemented um, as far as I know. So I think we're kind of off the hook there. Um, and we can you know get our house, house our side of things in order um, and not worry so much. Um, 
So yeah, I I mean, I I wouldn't I wouldn't want to not do this stuff because we think Shaw one is dead, because um, we're also not responsible for killing Shaw one. That's kind of on upstream Git and GitHub again. And so as as long as all this source code is at the end of the day going to be SHA-1 hash anyways. Um, there's already these sort of man-in-the-middle style um, collision attack potential. Because um, like when you're doing the Nix prefetch get or some other Nix fetch, you're not actually like checking at that point, did I get the data I want? The only source of truth you have is the SHA-1. And then you write down a NAR hash and commit that. And so you could have already gotten host. Um, there's nothing you can really do about that. Um, so I think, you know, given that we don't have that end to end story anyways, it's not, it's not, um, good to, you know, throw up our hands in the air and give up hope on this because of shot one. That makes sense. Uh, it's not our battle to fight. <laughs> up the hill. Yes. Precisely. Um, Mick 92 on owncast asks, does it, does it need one request per file? An example, one network one trip per file. Yeah, that's, that's why it's slow today, because <laughs> you have a bunch of tiny files, and it's not only doing the round trip, but it's renegotiating the um, connections. So it's, um, yeah, the, the bridge is, is just doing things in a naive way to show that the things are interoperable, and you have the perfect storm of all those issues. But um, IPFS already totally solves that problem. There's both, um, well, A, it uses quick, if possible, and so you you have great connection reuse to, between sort of logically distinct requests. Um, and B, it, um, uh, it has the graph sync I mentioned that will um, avoid the round trip and do a sort of higher level hole closure or get me all the hashes fetching. Um, so just need to find a way to bridge the what software heritage can do with that. And we'll be off to the races, no more terrible pipelining issues. Okay, cool. And then Ninja Trapper also an own cast asks, are there are the files substituted? Are the files substituted files compressed in some way? I think I read that right, but yeah, I um, think are the substituted files compressed in some way or not? I think. I don't know. And that's kind of the beauty of it. Um even with the this this ties into the previous question too. There is um a motto first make it correct then make it fast and there's a third part i don't remember and i think the um the content addressing stuff's really good for that because the actual thing i want to nail down in these early steps is not any of these implementation details is important that they are but the interface i'm presenting to the user that i'm um, presenting between the systems and that is the high level there's a content address, do something with that address, everything's self-verifying. And that's, I think, it's both a nice interface and an extremely flexible one. So you can set this up today where there's a clear weakest link, and then you can fix all that stuff behind the scenes, and anyone that's using the thing, they don't need to know what sort of fancy, um, fancy negotiation is to avoid the pipelines. They don't need to know what sort of compressing is being done on the fly all that is implementation details that aren't like shoved under the rug but actually transparent um and so that that difference between like ignoring complexity that like does matter and it actually is a wholly separate knob um i think is is, is something i value a lot and something i think will allow us to very seamlessly go from an existing proof of concept to like a, you know, slam dunk production system that, um, that without sense. any like, you know, interruptions or, uh, oh, we have to like do a bunch of breaking changes to their yeah. human there's visible. This, there's also this quote of um, premature optimization is the death of all good software. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, you can, I mean, if nothing else you can tell this thing has not been prematurely optimized. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> A minute per megabyte is, is not that. <laughs> no, okay. Um, I do not see any questions really coming in anymore, unless, of course, my internet has decided to drop all the connections, which I doubt. Um, so I think I will be wrapping this up then. Um, 
So yeah, thank you very much, Sean, for giving this amazing lecture and giving us an yep. update on Nixon IP as and the software heritage and also the, the great demo. Um, and yeah, we'll see you soon. And again, thank you. Great. Yeah, I'll head over to the matrix room for anyone who wants to keep on chatting. And thanks again, Brian. Really happy to be here today. Really yes. happy to. We are very happy to have yeah. you. So. <laughs> yes. Have a nice day, John. You too. So that's yet another lecture that is uh, wrapped up. There is not yet a lecture scheduled for next week. That might change. We don't know yet. Um, of course, I'll try to keep you updated on the relevant challenge. Channels, not challenges. Jesus. Now, of course, again, thank you everyone for watching. Thanks to the Anad Foundation, the European Commission, Nexus Foundation, and Tweak for making this all happen. If you want to ask John more questions, you can head over to the matrix, which you can see in the banner right now where to head to. And yeah, apart from that, I hope to see you all next time and I wish you all the best, you know, the best day possible. So see ya.